Hello and welcome to this worship service. My name is Carmen Little and I'm a lay leader with the Chetwin Shared Ministry. It is my pleasure to be able to worship with you today. Praise be to God who has freed us from oppression. Praise be to God who has healed our wounded souls. Let our hearts rejoice at God's redeeming love. Let our voices raise in songs of thanksgiving for all that God is doing for us. Come, let us worship the Lord with our whole hearts. May our praise and voices resound with joy. We begin with prayer. O God of cleansing waters, center our hearts on healing, mend our brokenness and our sadness. Gracious God, give us spirits of joy and enthusiasm for service to you by serving others. Lift us and place us on your pathways of peace and hope, that with our lives we will witness to your redeeming love. Messenger of peace, instruct us in your ways. Spirit of gentleness, make of us a new creation. Amen. Gentleness and a firm stance for peace are paths to healing, right relationships, and God's realm, even for the mighty, the prosperous, and the strong. In our reading from 2 Kings, Naaman almost allows his ego to prevent his own healing. 2 Kings chapter 5, verses 1 through 14. Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Aram, was a great man and in high favor with his master, because by him the Lord had given victory by Aram. The man, through a mighty warrior, suffered from a skin disease. Now, the Arameans, on one of their raids, had taken a young girl captive from the land of Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, If only my lord were with the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his skin disease. So Naaman went and told his lord just what the girl from the land of Israel had said. And the king of Aram said, Go then, and I will send along a letter to the king of Israel. He went, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten sets of garments. He brought the letter to the king of Israel, which read, When this letter reaches you, know that I have sent you my servant Naaman, that you may cure him of his skin disease. When the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to give death or life, that this man sends word to me to cure a man of his skin disease? Just look and see how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me. But when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent a message to the king. Why have you torn your clothes? Let him come to me that he may learn that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and chariots and halted at the entrance of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored, and you shall be clean. But Naaman became angry and went away, saying, I thought that for me they would surely come out and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, and would wave his hand over the spot and cure the skin disease. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? He turned and went away in a rage. But his servants approached and said to him, Father, if the prophet had commanded you to do something difficult, would you not have done it? How much more when all he said to you was wash and be clean? So he went down and immersed himself seven times in the Jordan according to the word of the man of God. His flesh was restored like the flesh of a young boy, and he was clean. There are many stories in the Old Testament which may make little sense to us, stories which are difficult to understand or confusing or maybe even offensive. So when we have a story like this one from 2 Kings, full of interesting characters and human intrigue, it's important to take note. Our story this morning has a few important characters, but it focuses on the healing of Naaman, a great warrior in the army who suffered from what our ancestors called leprosy. The main characters are the Armenian warrior Naaman and the prophet Elisha of Israel, chosen successor to Elijah, and Elisha eventually tells Naaman how he can be healed. The king of Aram and the king of Israel both appear as characters, but they do not drive the plot, nor does the wife of Naaman. 
The plot is driven by nameless servants who matter a good deal more in the story than do the pair of kings and the wife. First, we are told that Naaman's wife has a servant girl from the land of Israel, a girl whom he had likely captured and stolen on one of his raids. This girl, who has been taken from her hometown, becomes the catalyst for his healing. She sees the effect, the hold that this illness has on his life, and she suggests something to her mistress. She shares the information about the prophet Elisha in Samaria. She believes that this prophet has the capacity to heal Naaman. There would be no story if this nameless servant girl had not suggested that her master really ought to go and see the prophet who could cure him of his disease. As a response to this news, Naaman tells his king. He goes to his higher up and says that he just might have the potential to be healed. And the king listens and puts his authority behind this plan. He writes a letter to the king of Israel, ruler to ruler, to put his weight behind the plan. When Naaman arrives in Samaria, the chief city in the northern kingdom of Israel, he has brought with him a show of wealth, all his horses and chariots, a quantity of gold and silver, and ten changes of clothing. Clearly, he expects that healing his skin disease will be an expensive and elaborate production. The king of Israel, who receives this letter, panics. He tears his clothes and despairs. Am I God? he asks. Can I bring death or life? This man is trying to fight me. He feels that too much is being asked of him, and he doesn't know how to respond. So while the king is having his panic attack, Elisha hears about it. He hears that the king has torn his clothes, and he sends his own message. Send Naaman to me. So once again, Naaman goes off on his journey. Again, we have a nameless servant, a messenger from Elisha, who meets Naaman and instructs the warrior to bathe seven times in the Jordan River. Naaman is quite offended by this message. He thinks there are back rivers back home in Aram that are better than the Jordan. Then we have more nameless servants. Indeed, if it were not for the courage and persuasive abilities of Naaman's servants, the story would have ended right there with Naaman stalking off in rage. The proud warrior listens to his servants, however, and immerses himself seven times in the Jordan, and just as the servant girl indicated, Naaman is cured. The manner of the healing turns Naaman's expectations inside out and upside down. The prophet Elisha is not even present, and there are no prayers, incantations, no laying on of hands, nothing one would have associated with healing at that time. There is a powerful subtext, subtext to this story. God brings healing to foreigners as well as to the people of Israel. As St. Paul says several hundred years later, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision is anything but a new creation is everything. The scope and reach of God's authority and healing action is a theme echoed in Luke chapter 10. Having previously sent the 12 disciples out on an exploratory journey, here Jesus sends out 72 more of his disciples to every town and place where he himself intends to go. The 72 go out as the bearers of God's power in much the same way that Jesus did. Just as Elisha did not need to be present with Naaman, Jesus does not have to be physically present with his followers when they go out in mission. In both stories, the mighty power of God to heal and save supporters supports all the human activities involved. This immediate presence of God's power is what Jesus was referring to when he said, Whoever listens to you listens to me, and whoever rejects you rejects me, and whoever rejects me rejects the one who sent me. Through the disciples' activities, God proclaimed his presence and power, and this direct, immediate, self-proclaiming presence of God amazed and excited Jesus' disciples. 
They came back from their missionary journeys full of joy and saying, Lord, in your name, even the demons submit to us. This reaction, however, betrays the fact that they were taking the success of their healing and exorcisms personally rather than as bearers of God's presence. Jesus' response to this inflation of their egos gently brings them down to earth. Do not rejoice in this, that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. So God uses people to form people. It's not always pleasant to face our fears of speaking up in the name of our Lord, but it is good, and it is what God calls and empowers us to do. Working in the strength that he provides, we have a promise that he will work out his will when his truth is spoken through us. We are conduits of the gospel, being redeemed for use and glorifying the Father in heaven. We are living, breathing conduits that God can use to glorify his name any place and any time. It is amazing that God chooses to us to be such ordinary people for his extraordinary purposes. This role of connecting the power of God to the people of the world is supremely and fully embodied in Jesus. We do not all have the gift of being great communicators, but we can all be great connectors, even if we don't think of ourselves as prophets. Part of what it means to be made in God's image is our capacity for connectedness. Because God created human beings and then said, it isn't good for man to be alone. When a tree puts roots into the ground, those roots are able to take in nutrients and water, and the tree grows and has life and strength, but only if it is rooted. In the same way we are rooted and our souls are nourished in the love of God and other people, we experience this both physically and emotionally when we connect with somebody. Whenever there is an exchange of genuine caring, it is as if the roots of your soul are getting fed. Every life has to have connectedness. We are designed to flourish in connectedness. Like the nameless servants who drive the story of Naaman, our job is to be the connectors of God's extraordinary, abundant, and life-giving power to those who need it. For love, peace, and justice, and for the repair of the world's fabric, may the Lord make it so. And now let us, God's people, pray. Loving Lord, who holds our souls in life, arouse us in heart and mind to bear one another's burdens as we labor in your fields. Help us so to the Spirit to reap a plentiful harvest for the good of all, especially for the family of faith. O God of all and everywhere, we find our strength in you. Loving Lord, Spare the lambs of your pasture from the wolves of unbridled self-interest that lurk in many global and local governments now and in the ones to come. O God of all and everywhere, we find our strength in you. Loving Lord, comfort all who are trapped in chronic sickness, poverty, or depression, and lighten the hearts of all who give support. Loving Lord, as you console hearts in the depths of grief, infuse a spark of joy that grows into rejoicing to know that those we have sent to you are a new creation of life, love, and peace for all eternity. O God of all and everywhere, we find our strength in you. Nurturing, knowing God, excite our desire to shake off the dust of our own complacency and to immerse ourselves in your service. Grant special grace to the country of our birth and the one we call home, that your presence will be known in how our lives bless you by all that we do in the spirit of gentleness and in the name of Christ. We ask through Jesus our Redeemer and the Holy Spirit our Sustainer, who together with you are one God, infinite and eternal. Amen. And now, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.